Hello and welcome to the AMA Update video and podcast series. Today we're diving into this year's match results for emergency medicine programs and discussing what we can learn from them. I'm joined today by Dr. Holly Coretta Wire, Associate Residency Program Director of the Stanford University Emergency Medicine Residency in Palo Alto, California. She's also a PI in the AMA Reimagining Residency Initiative. Welcome, Dr. Coretta Wire. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Todd. Uh, pleasure. Well, uh, let's start by going back a year for just a moment. The 2022 Emergency Medicine Match saw what at the time was an unprecedented 219 unmatched positions. And I think that many people kind of wrote that off as a byproduct of the pandemic. But fast forward now to this year's match, and EM saw that number more than double. I think it was around 555 initially unmatched positions. Let's just start, kind of what was your reaction when you saw this year's numbers? Sure, I think, I think I probably speak for all of us in emergency medicine. We were all shocked. We felt like it would likely be similar, if not maybe slightly more than last year, but I think 555 came as a shock to all of us. Well, a joint statement released by 11 emergency medicine groups during match week cited a number of possible reasons for the decline. But if we go back, let's say three or four years, emergency medicine was one of the most, most competitive specialties. And so given this, it's only natural to kind of look at the pandemic, obviously as a big or at least partial reason. What do you, what do you think? Sure, I think the pandemic certainly plays a role. Obviously we as emergency physicians were on the front lines of the pandemic and initially that meant taking a lot of risk, um, but also being viewed as a hero. And a lot of students felt the call to, still to emergency medicine at that point, but also felt like their eyes were open that yes, there was inherent risks in the position that they're seeking, um, but inherent rewards in that you're viewed as the front lines um, of the healthcare system by society. Fast forward now to today when we're no longer viewed necessarily as heroes, but as the ones mitigating the bursting volumes of the healthcare system, the issues with lower staffing um, and just incredible um, increase in volumes of patients coming to the hospital, boarding in the emergency department um, and seeking care and often feeling like we can't provide the best possible care that we had um, hoped prior to the pandemic. Well, that ties in uh, nicely to our next uh, topic area, which is about workforce projections. That's another reason uh, possibly cited for this. But, um, you know, overall, when we talk about uh, physicians, we are looking at kind of a looming shortage. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case within this particular specialty. And a study published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine last August projected what could be a surplus of emergency physicians by the year 2030. How are you thinking about this at Stanford and what role do you think it played in the declining applicants this year? The jobs report definitely played a role. Um, you talk to advisors from medical schools and residency program directors and many applicants were asking, what are my job prospects once I finish my training? Um, so the ASAP jobs report definitely is top of mind for a lot of applicants, but also um, us as residency program leadership teams. and. It's interesting because ASAP and other organizations have sort of walked back the jobs report to some extent uh, because we've seen an incredible amount of attrition uh, of practicing emergency physicians kind of as the, the pandemic is tailed off. Um, so we may actually not have the surplus that that jobs report projected. Um, so this is kind of a compounding problem now that we have less students entering emergency medicine, both because of the pandemic and this jobs report. Um, we at Stanford are taking the approach that it is simply our job, our responsibility as program leadership to continue to um, train our uh, residents to the best of our ability to be amazing emergency physicians, um, but also prepare for the future of the specialty um, in order for them to get the jobs that they're after in a place that they are um, interested in working. Um, and we, to date, we've had excellent success with that, but I think that that is very much top of mind, not just for us, but for every emergency medicine residency program and ensuring their graduates are able to get the job that they're after in a place that they want to work. So uh, interesting that you should mention issues uh, about attrition. We know from research coming out of late from the AMA 
uh, that due to issues like burnout, lack of autonomy, burden, we're seeing kind of one in, fi one in five physicians uh, saying they may leave medicine. So these are issues, obviously, that, uh, that, are, that are broader than emergency medicine. But uh, obviously, when you're thinking about your programs and how you support residents, uh, particularly in this environment, you know, you're thinking about how do I address this? Tell us more about that. Yeah, so it's hard. Um, you know, burnout is not necessarily something that, you know, we can deal with on an individual level. It's not more meditation. It's not more pizza. It's not taking time to, to you know, take breaks on shift necessarily. It's, it's really this idea of systems level issues. It's not making individual providers more resilient. Um, and so in the emergency department, big contributors to that are, you know, being able to take care of patients the way we feel like we should be taking care of patients, optimally providing good patient care. And the overcrowding and the long wait times and boarding in the emergency department has certainly led to residents feeling like we're not providing the best possible care to patients because they're waiting to get their ultimate treatment. They're waiting in the waiting room to even be seen by a provider and potentially getting sicker than they need to while they're waiting. Um, so that all kind of creates this suboptimal learning environment in which you feel like you're not doing your best as a resident um, or as an attending physician to take care of patients when that's really what you signed up to do. The other thing in emergency medicine is this idea of kind of, you know, between physician conflict since we're the front of the house. Um, you know, we're calling to admit patients, we're calling to consult with other providers. And there's often this conflict between, you know, residents and attendings and providers on other services. Um, you know, when you don't call the right person or you call someone and they feel like, you know, this person's better served on a different service and all of a sudden, you know, the emergency medicine resident is the phone tree for the hospital instead of taking care of patients and having that, um, you know, direct patient care or feeling like they're doing the right thing in the most efficient way possible for their patients. Um, and so it's not just taking care of, you know, patients, it's also taking care of yourself on shift and how do you deal with you know, those interpersonal conflicts or feeling like you're hitting your head against a wall when you're just trying to do the right thing. Well, it sounds like, based on what we talked about, there are a number of potential drivers for what we saw in terms of the match results this year. But regardless, we've got two years of some, you know, concerns. Uh, there's been a match task force convened to identify, you know, which of those drivers are really uh, at work here and to develop strategies to mitigate them. Is this kind of an emergency medicine problem that needs to be solved right now with urgency? I mean, we're emergency physicians. I think we solve a lot of things with urgency. Um, so it makes sense that this is the response. Um, I do think that there are things that will course correct naturally. Um, I do think that you will see residency programs perhaps that have lower volumes of patients um, or perhaps more um, less conducive learning environments perhaps shrink, you know, the same way we saw those in anesthesia in the 90s also have a similar um, contraction in residency positions naturally based on exposure to caseload and patient mix. Um, you know, you think about emergency departments with a volume of 30,000 or less supporting a residency program that can be very difficult. Um, so I think you'll see some natural contraction um, on the program side for number of spots based on patient volume. Um, and thinking about states where there are a lot of residency programs per population versus states where there are very few residency programs based on the state population, I think making a little bit more of a, a match between those two things. Um, when you think about you know the things that probably need to be addressed urgently, it may not be the match itself. It's more the environment of emergency medicine and how we talk about our specialty. Because I think a lot of the, the burnout and the harm that's been done to emergency physicians as part of the pandemic and um, in the years afterward has certainly trickled down to students um, in hearing about our specialty in a very specific way. Um, and I think a lot of the, the things that are going to fix that are going to be addressing the burnout, the corporatization of medicine, autonomy, systems issues um, more urgently than perhaps the symptoms, which is what you're seeing in the mm -hmm. lower um, entrance into emergency medicine as a specialty through the match. Is there anything else that you want to see uh, come out of this task force? 
I mean, I think the big things are looking at the drivers. Why are people not choosing emergency medicine? And yeah, I think there's the obvious ones of the pandemic, the boarding, the burnout, um, the loss of on the loss of autonomy. The jobs report, I think, is a big one. I think it's really more looking at what is what are the root causes, what's driving this, and what do we need to look internally for um, and fix in our own house, and then what are the external things that we're going to need to load the boat with as far as thinking about you know national organizations is it going to governmental level and saying you know we're providing poor patient care in a lot of instances because of boarding and overcrowding we need to address staffing we need to address you know the number of emergency departments per capita in certain areas there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be really clearly within kind of our control um in the immediate future and then things that are going to be bigger picture in the long range Dr. Coretta Weyer, we've talked a lot about the challenges, and again, these are pretty global right now in medicine, um, but there are a lot of great reasons to go into emergency medicine. So for students who are watching or listening uh, to this right now, what do you want them to know about emergency medicine and why they should choose it or consider it as a career path? I mean, I think the big reason to consider emergency medicine, first and foremost, is the same as it's always been. Um, if you want to take care of anyone, anytime, any place without consideration as to their ability to pay, this is the specialty for you. I didn't want to give up seeing kids. I didn't want to give up seeing adults, surgical problems, medical problems, psychiatric problems. I wanted to be able to take care of anyone, anytime, any place. If someone is sick on a plane, I wanted to be the person that they called. Um, and that is still the reason to do emergency medicine. The second reason is we are at the forefront of the future of medicine. We are thinking about how care gets delivered, not just in the hospital, not just in the emergency department, but how it gets delivered to people who are at home, outside of the hospital, after the hospital. You know, you think about the explosion of um, the um, subspecialization of social emergency medicine. It's how do we think about you know, our patient zip code or their um, social determinants of health, how does that affect their aftercare? How does that affect us getting them care before they come to the emergency department? Much the same as DoorDash is thinking about how to get people their food using a drone. We're thinking about how to get people care at, you know, the pre-hospital uh, level, hospital at home. Um, so, you know, you think about chat GPT to take your test. It's more like thinking about how emergency medicine is going to deliver care to anyone, anytime, uh, any place, not just the hospital now. Um, so if, you, if you're someone who's really into innovation, this is really a specialty that's for you. Well, I like that. You've got the marketing uh, down right there. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being here, Dr. Coretta Wire. It's been really informative and we'll continue to track this uh, throughout the year. Uh, that's it for today's episode. Uh, we'll be back soon with another. In the meantime, you can find all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care.